from the city of Chicago, a city most recently known for its crime and violence. On this podcast, we will be sharing stories of redemption from individuals raised in the tough streets of Chicago and from around the country. Some of them were gang members, drug dealers, incarcerated, victims and perpetrators of violence. Listen to my guests as they share their experiences, struggles, trauma, but also the strength, hope, faith, and perseverance these have developed in them to keep pushing and moving forward in life. Tune in to hear how their lives have gone from darkness to light and from wrong to strong. I'm your host. My name is Omar Calvillo. And tonight, you guys are in for a, for a treat. I got my brother. His name is James L. Capra. He's a currently a CEO and founder of the Frontline Leadership Group. Uh, they're dedicated to developing tomorrow's leaders today. Uh, Mr. James Capra has successfully managed and led thousands of multi-generational employees during his governor tenure, having served in numerous leadership of positions. He now shares his successful strategies on how to effectively develop outstanding organizational leaders across generational boundaries in the global business arena. Jimmy, as he is known by his friends and colleagues, retired after nearly three decades with the Drug Enforcement Administration. Prior to his retirement, Jimmy served as a chief of global operations, responsible for 227 domestic offices and 86 foreign offices in 67 countries. Uh, prior to his DEA career, Jimmy served in the U.S. Navy, U.S. Navy Reserves, Air National Guard, and as a military intelligence officer for the U.S. Army Reserves. Well, welcome to the podcast, brother. Thanks, brother. Uh, thank you for having me on, man. I got to tell you, I am, I'm just so, so honored that you had have me on, man. I, I really mean that. It's, uh, you know, Bill Fay, who is a brother of ours. I've known Bill for well over 20 years. And uh, when he got me connected. I said, this is great. Said, Would you like to? I said, heck yeah, man. Come on, let's do it. Mm, no, th th thank you so much for being here. That was actually going to be one of the first questions I was going to ask you. Like, I was going to ask you, how does someone with all these, you know, uh, credentials, with an established <laughs> career, uh, end up on a podcast with a guy who has no uh, credentials, you know, absolutely no credentials, you know? <laughs> you got, well, you know what, brother? You got all the credentials in the world knowing Jesus. And I don't say that because it's, uh, it it's funny in my line of work and my career, uh, I was doing, um, I had a radio show for, for a year and I often have guys on and, and a lot of these guys were warriors and backgrounds. And I, well, it's, it's funny because people would ask me, goes, how do you contend with being a Christian and, and doing your line of work, locking people up and investigating people? I says, I, I don't know how to do it without it. I don't know how I'd survive without it when you see the underside, but I'm a, I'm a guy that barely got out of high school. I was told throughout my high school years that, um, I was never going to get anywhere. I was told that we were, you know, I was a loser. I was told that my family was uh, a bunch of losers. Uh, there were seven of us growing up. My dad was a was a, a, a retired New York City cop who got hurt on the job real bad. And um, uh, anyway, we're a terrible student. But uh, yeah, so I, I was pretty much told throughout my my um, formative years outside my family. My family was uh, at a, my, my dad, we think, had a 10th grade education. My mom, uh, um, I think she had a high school graduation, but they were good parents, strict, strict, strict. But uh, uh, but the rest of the outside community would say, you know, in, in school and stuff, even teachers would look at us and shake their heads. So that's, you know, that's not, did it, did it bother me? No, I, you know, we grew up kind of tough, you know, because of my old man and his family came from Italy. My mom's family came from Portugal. So we, we were pretty, uh, we probably weren't tough, like street tough. You know what I'm saying, brother? That took a while. That took a while for me when I came on the on the job. But I mean, we were tough in handling criticism and stuff like that. But uh, the, the one good thing that I'm, I'm, I'm number one thing I'm thankful for is, you know, my, my parents got me introduced to Jesus when I was relatively young. And it wasn't this, you know, and I'm sure you have to deal with it sometimes. It wasn't this happy, holy, healthy, wealthy club. Right. It wasn't this. Oh, everything is fine. You know, sometimes life still sucked. Sometimes bad things happen. You know, you got to, and you have to contend with that. And uh, but that was the best thing that happened. I, you know, gave my life to the Lord when I was relatively young. But, you know, I joined the Navy and realized, man, the world's got a lot of great stuff out there that I want to see. I want to taste. I want to do. I, I, didn't, I didn't know you can go to these kind of clubs. and I didn't know you could do this. And I, so I kind of went off the railroad tracks for, you know, for a while. And when I got out after my first 
tour and started school. Wind up meeting my wife, who was the best thing that ever happened. We've been we've been uh, well, it's married now uh, almost forty two years. Wow, Thanks. with six Thanks. kids and Thanks. stuff. So Thanks. yeah, she was she's my outside of the Lord. She was my north star. It still is, buddy. Yeah, um, amen. amen. Uh, you know, you, you you know what? Can, can I ask you something? Because I, I know you. Yeah. Went, you know you, you went into the. Uh, uh, would you say in? Um, what was the first one you went to the reserves? Or? I mean, the first the first service I went to was the Navy. Oh, the Navy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, I know. I, I like I told you before we started recording that I watched one of the interviews you did, and you were talking yeah. about your dad, and I believe he was a veteran of the Korean War. Is yeah, that my dad. Yeah, my dad uh, left school. He was in tenth grade. He, he dropped out to you know join the army and fight in Korea, and then uh, is what you what you did, and and came home. Uh, um, you know, went on the police department, married my mom, and then uh, you're not even 16 years later, really horrible wreck. He was a motor officer, motorcycle, broke his back and neck, and which which sounds terrible, but it was probably a blessing for his children because we wound up moving out of New York City to upstate New York and and on a big piece of property up there. But uh, yeah, yeah. But all the sons, so, so there were six boys and a girl, and all of uh, you know, all of us, actually including my sister, my sister. Uh, wind up marrying my best friend growing up who was a little bit older than me and they they both became pastors for 40 years oh, wow. and he's a guy that he's a guy who used to run around the back road smoking cigarettes and drinking beer solving the problems of the world you know he meets my sister you know and i'm like what the heck man i'm no longer in the front seat with him anymore right. and uh uh when i got married went back into the service for a while he uh amazing he's an amazing story you know and and just decided that's enough and and um started uh started attending a seminary and he's pastored a church now for over 40 years oh, wow so yeah pretty cool how god does stuff man yeah, it's yeah. you know i you know another another guy if, he, if his story is amazing because another guy that who people would look at and go man you're, you're not you're not going to go anywhere you know one of those so gotcha okay you, you know what i, I want to ask you about, about your dad because it sounds like he had like a lot of influence on you you know, he was in the military. He eventually yeah. became a police officer. And yeah. uh, I, I was hearing you talk about, like, one of the things he did, because uh, I know, like, uh, military and, and, and the police, I mean, you yeah. guys are pretty tough, and you deal with tough people, but there were some things that that, that he taught you about the people that he was, like, uh, interacting with, like yeah. uh, how, how to look at them and how to even treat those that were out there breaking the law you you want to share a, a, a yeah you know what one of the things about my dad with 10th grade education I and mean, was like i said he's a tough guy i didn't talk back to my father till my second year in the navy and even then i was afraid to talk back to all he's going to hit me with a two by four but uh um i just be honest man but he was tough as nails but he was a good man i mean we lost him really young and he i mean it was just a he was a good man but one of the things about my father was uh my father would tell it tell you all the time treat everybody with dignity and respect. I don't care where they came from. I don't care, you know, who they are. I don't care the color. I don't care. I don't care who they are. And, and the story that he told me once is really kind of galvanized it. I, again, I, I've written a, hand, a handful of books, Omar. And believe me, if, if, if I have, I don't know why I would have teachers that would be still alive. Or if some of the friends that I had or acquaintances I had in high school, if they, if they looked my, my bio up and said, wait a minute, this guy went to college and read, they wrote books. They'd be saying, he's a liar, man. He didn't he didn't do any of that stuff. He got it from the internet. But one of the things when I started writing, one of the I talked about my dad, and I realized how much he cared for people because he was a tough guy. I mean, it was it was no I, we didn't we didn't have in my house we didn't have these um, you know like sometimes the movies predict. Here's this you know European family sitting down, the dad's talking nicely. My my father every now and then come up behind you when I was young and just smack me upside of the head, not hard or anything. It wasn't hurt me. And I go, hey, Pop, what was that for? He goes, because you're up to something. I just know it. I know you're up to something. But it but was a, uh, a, a, a preemptive strike. Uh. Yeah, yeah, exactly, man. Exactly. But but one of the things about my father would say, he, he would he would tell you all the time, he'd say, a liar is worse than a thief. I want to let you know that. He says, a liar is worse than a thief. He said, be the kind of guy. That's how he grew up. He says, be the kind of person that people look towards and they want them on their team. They want them in their unit, not because you're the smartest guy. It's because you care about things and you want to do things right. He said, that's it. So he was big on integrity. He was big on your position as a, a what manhood was all about. You know, what man, you know, manhood wasn't all about the, you know, the, the macho go out and, you know, try to sleep with the debts. He was, you know, he, he wasn't against it, but he never, he never used any of those fluffy words, brother. He would just sit there and, and, and say things I was 
I was, he was telling me a story one time, and this will encapsulate it. He says he remember when he would, he, when he talk, he loved being a cop and, and he would tell these stories, but they were never about, you know, chasing people, gunfights and everything. He would talk about people on his beat. He would talk about the people that were eking out in existence. And, I, and I'll never forget a, one particular story uh, that he was talking about. They had to go around and they had to round up the, the local prostitutes that were really coming. He worked in Midtown when Midtown was kind of like Hollywood. I mean, it was late fifties into the sixties and it really was Midtown used to be. So it was a, a for, for a beat cop who worked, you know, the beat and walking, it, it was a pretty good beat, but he had to, you know, he had to go around. They were saying, Hey, you gotta, you know, round up these gals and bring them in and everything. And he needs stop. And he, he kind of just look away. He goes, you know what, no matter why they did what they did with their bodies, what the reason was, he goes, I never forgot that they were women. And I tried to do best to treat them like that. Then he would stop and he'd look at me. He goes, always treat people with dignity and respect. And it, and it took me a little bit time to realize he had to do his job, but he treated people well. I mean, he, treat, I mean, he, he here, here, so here are these girls who are selling themselves on the street. And my father's thinking they're still women. They still need to be treated like, to, you know, like women and stuff. And, and I think some of that sometimes is, is lost, you know, when we're, we're trying to raise kids and do stuff. We're trying to use all these uh, ideas that are out there just saying, hey, man, try to treat people with dignity. I don't care. And, you know, I carried that in, in my career, man. I, I, you know, during some of the some of the guys and gals that I've arrested over my course of my career, I remember sitting down with some of them. Listen, I'm not I'm not telling you I I tried to preach to him and everything else. But I, one guy comes, he, he was going to do some major time. It was, it was a pretty big organization slinging some major some major coke and, and and he just caught him by the short hairs. You could tell he was a young guy. And I remember sitting there thinking to myself, this guy, he threw everything away for, for that money, man, everything away. And people say, Hey, do you feel good when people get locked up? I've been, I lived in court half of my career prosecute people. And I, I gotta be honest with you. You sit there and I don't, I don't think I've ever, I'm, first of all, no, I've never been shot at by any bad guy. So you know, I don't, I don't have that story. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm thankful Lord, you know, I never had to shoot at anybody. I, I, I mean, I stuck my head, my gun in a lot of guys' faces, you know, a lot of bad guys' faces, but I've never had to. And the only time I did shoot my gun is there was a pit bull charging me and I missed anyway. So it's a good thing I didn't have to. Right, right. Fire gun. But, but the idea, I think one of the things about being a Christian is you're sitting there and you're watching these men in particular, mostly men getting sentenced and my heart is literally breaking, thinking their family at the whole nine yard, the whole it's just being tossed down the, the toilet because of freaking money, man. Because that that greed and that desire for power and money. And I remember telling this one kid who used to be was a formerly a Marine and you know, he's involved in an organization with his family, and he was just said they're so stupid he took over. Well, we wind up bagging him with uh, over 300 kilos, and and uh he sat there. I go, listen, dude, all I can tell you is there's hope there's you're there. I know there's a big, looks like a white, you know, light at the end of the tunnel and it ain't a train. I said, but you, you're going to have to decide, you know, what are you going to do from here out? Who, who are you going to rely on? And I, I said, I can just tell you there's still a God in heaven who, who knows that you exist. So, you know, th th those are the kind, I never got that. I never, and I'm not trying to be Joe humble brother. You know what I mean? I'm not trying to, Oh, he's such a, you know, I'm a chucklehead. But but I always it always kind of grieved me to watch guys get sentenced to major time and stuff. And some guys, there's some guys that are still in jail. Yeah. But you see, your heart's is breaking for them. But you know, the only the only thing that's going to help them it's not it's it may not it might not get them out of jail or anything. But in eternity, right? That's when it, that's really when it matters in, in eternity. And so you asked me, you know, you asked me about those. So my father's my father had a big influence on how we look at people and how. Hey, hey trust me, there's been times, you know. There's been times on a street fighting with somebody that you want to freaking pull their heads off. That's that's got to be, you know, you're and especially if you're fighting, you know, for your life or something. Or you know, hey, man, if I don't get a control of this, bad stuff's going to happen fast. And most of the time we we outnumbered the, the bad guys. But but I I never from me, from my heart, I never took, you know, great pleasure into watching the demise of some, you know, some bad guy somewhere. It was his fault, her fault. But I did say, his, how, how great is that? He's going to, I just, my, my heart was like, man, 
you know, you know, and I always, you always did my best to, to when you, when we did talk to them, to talk to them with the level of, you know, respect, not that they were some kind of piece of garbage. Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. They committed a crime. Yeah. This, that, you know, they're a human being. And so I did my, you know, did my best in my profession and what, what I thought was not only responsible for me, but, but as a Christian, you know, to talk to people, you know, as if I don't hold anything over their heads. You know what I mean, man? That's, yeah. that's the kind of impact it is. Okay. And I can do the same thing at work. Right. You know what? I was going to ask you, I know you mentioned like in, like in high school, you weren't like the brightest. So obviously, you know, you made it to, <laughs> no, to a big career. I was the dullest, <laughs> was the dullest knife in the, in the, <laughs> in the drawer. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but uh, maybe God's grace, but uh, you, you know what? One thing I, I know you yeah. were on the, on, the, on the Bible study on that Friday and, and two things that, uh, that stood out to me. Uh, well, one of them, I know you, you, you mentioned God, obviously, that helped you, but the other one was your wife as well. And yeah. I, a lot of the men that I've had on this podcast that have been, you know, like successful, they always bring up the wife. They, they either yeah. have a praying wife, a wife that encourages them. Yeah. Uh, so you want to tell us about that? Uh, uh, maybe, uh, you know, like I, I got a, yeah, I got a, um, so I got out of the, got out of the Navy, started school, never thought, never, never thought I was going to. I said, how, how am I going to get to college? I mean, I, I'm an idiot. And I, I don't, like I said, that sounds good, Omar. Oh, that guy's being humble. But I, I knew academically that I was a box of rocks. I didn't, I didn't do anything. In I don't, you know, it's funny because we, we look back and we knew the kids who were using dope and we knew the kids who didn't do it. Well, I was a good kid, but I was one of those, I was one of the guys who go, I don't know if that guy could spell his name. You know, that's, that's like, I was like, you know, that was me, man. And so I, I found a small school in upstate New York that I went to. And the first day of school, I met what would be my, Michelle, I met my wife. And, and she floored me, not, not even because she was a good looking woman, but everything I got to know her over the course of a few weeks and her moral compass, what it was and her drive and everything. And, and, and what I did, man, is I went to the site because I, within about two weeks, I knew there's something about this woman. There's something about it. And uh, I told a buddy of mine, who's was a Navy buddy of mine, who grew up in Spanish Harlem. Uh, we made a pact to go to school together. I said, dude, I'm going to marry this girl. He goes, man, what are you, what's wrong with you? He goes, what the heck, man? We just got here. I go, I, I'm just telling you, man, I'm going to marry this girl. All true story. So when Shelly and I started dating, I started thinking to myself, I am, I am a class A chucklehead. I'm going to screw this up. Or the same thing that I was doing in the Navy, this is going to catch up to me. You know, man, how, how good God is. I went to the side of the building where she was staying and I just started praying. I said, Lord, you know, I'll screw this thing up. I said, please, if, if I'm not supposed to be in this relationship, if I'm not, if she's not for me, then you got to shut down. I said, because, and I was kind of blue. I said, cause I'll F it up. That's basically what I, how I, that's how I talk to the Lord. Right. I, I know it's not good, but it's, but that's, I was being honest, man. Yeah. I just, I will. I will screw this thing up. And I, and I really was just, it was just my heart. Well, we we start getting more doing, you know, asked her to marry me about three months later. And that, like I said, that's about 42, 43 years ago. Um, and then she came, she, you know, she grew up Catholic and came to the Lord through my family. My mom was a, was a prayer warrior and she's one of the most resilient women. I She's my biggest advocate, my biggest, when I would, you know, well, I was finishing, I was finishing school. I was working and I was in the surf, you know, I was in the reserves and uh, anybody else would say, Hey, what are you doing? How come you do, you know, she was constantly pushing. I had this desire and this dream to become a federal agent. Never think, didn't think I was going to ever be able to do it. Cause I know the guy, see, I know the guy looking back in the mirror at the time, you know, I know that guy. And that guy is, you know, that guy is secretly in his mind is a, is a loser. He's not going to be able to make it. And, and, and all this other stuff. Well, he did make it by God's right. And because of my wife. Get, so God, here it is. I, God's never whispered to me. He's never spoke to me, but pe you know, through like people like my wife or other people, you know, that men have come in contact with in my life. He's put people in my, he's put my, my wife in my life to say, Hey, there's the mark. There's the North star rock and roll. Let's go. And she's always been like that, dude. I, for weeks at a time, I live on this. I live on the street, on, doing investigation. I mean, live on the on the street in the back of a car. She's pregnant, has one, or, or we have two or three, and and I'm doing this. And you would figure you'd come home, and never, never once did she say, "What are you doing? What's wrong with you?" As a matter of fact, and I know I'm rambling, brother. I'm sorry. No, no, this is good. This is good. Yeah. 
you know, came home one time. She hadn't seen her fair. She hadn't seen her folks in about two years. We were, we were living in LA at the time. And uh, I was just living on the street. I was chasing this group of really, really super bad guys that were using tractor trails to move dope. And I, I hooked on to one and me and my partner. And uh, I came home one night, just one night out of about two weeks. Her parents were there for like a week and a half. I saw them for like three hours. And they were, they were wonderful people. Her dad was a former World War II guy and everything. And I remember coming home. I was a, I was a smoker back then. So I'd sit at the end of the table. They were asleep and it's 11 o'clock at night. All I want to do is take a shower, grab a new set of clothes and head out the door. And I tell people, probably any other wife would have been saying, what are you doing? My parents are here, this, that. And the other thing, first thing is, how's it going? I said, it's good. I said, I think we're close, blah, blah, blah. I said, how's mom and dad? She goes, well, you know. Her mother started asking her, how can you live like this? Now, they, they liked me. They, you know, they, there wasn't that. How, how can you live like this? How can you, how, how do you do this? This is incredible. This is not how a marriage should be. And my wife, because she's my wife, my partner, she says, you don't understand. This is my, this is my husband's career. This is his passion. And this is his calling. She goes, we're good. We're good with this. He's, he's going to be fine. And then people would often ask her, goes, they would say to her, because because we wind up eventually having six kids, they would say, "What what do you do when he goes off to work? What do you I mean? How do you you don't know if he's doing this? You don't know." She goes, "I don't have time to worry about it. I just give it to the Lord and say, Lord, you got this. You know, you you got." So that's kind of that's only so I you you know you heard of Proverbs thirty one right? She's a Proverbs thirty one wife, and I don't say that lightly. When you read Proverbs thirty one, man, it's powerful. It's powerful, man. You know, uh, uh, it, nothing is lost on this. When people say Proverbs 31, I go, that's that's a pretty powerful thing. That's how my wife, I mean, even even my kids now that they're grown and have kids of their own, look at their mother and go, how, how did you how did you do that? I do the same thing. I, go, I had it easy. I, listen, man, I'm the dude that went out, caught bad guys, you know, got promotions, got patted on the back. You know, everybody's, ooh, look at that guy. Meanwhile, here's this gal. By the way, she's smarter than I am. She, she has a real degree. She has a math degree and a computer science degree. She could be the CEO at IBM. No joke, Omar. She could be. But early on, one of the things that, yes, again, I'm going on about, one of the things that we, we talked about incessantly when we were first dating is children, moral compass, what, what careers, all this other stuff. And, and it's probably why we were attracted. She said, uh, you know, we, her her thing was when it was time to have children. I'm we're raising our kids. I'm not having. It's just one. I mean, it's hard to do today. I know with income. Listen, I get it, and I would never tell anybody else how you should or shouldn't do that. You're just up to them. Yeah. But but that's how she was, man. That's where you know she's driven. She was just driven out, driven with her family, pouring into her kids. She's a prayer warrior. You know, she'd also look at me from time to time and look at me and go, you know, a little bit too big for your britches, aren't you there, son? <laughs> so she, you think you missed it. You know, you may think you missed a cool guy, big shot at work, but hey, guess what? I'm not taking out the garbage and doing the dishes once in a while. <laughs> hey, you know, you, know, where you eat some humble pie, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to make light of it, but it is important. You know, in my, in my bedroom, I have, a, I have a big sign that if somebody gave me, it says, so one life and one wife. You know, we've we've lived in a time where, hey, we get tired of it. Let's try something new. We get tired of something. We try something new. I call them collectors. Something. And listen, sometimes things happen in marriages. I get it, man. And I, I'm, I understand that. But sometimes things happen. But, but we we promise. You said about my one of the things we promise is we were never going to give up. And and you know we're never going to give up. So we we went through seasons like everything else, man. We went through seasons financially. We went through seasons. I'm sure she did. Looked at it, go, "What the hell am I doing with this guy?" You know. So, uh, but I, but I, I did my best uh, to be the best husband I can be, the best father that I could be, and and I promised myself that I would run from stuff. And it's the one thing about, I think, for me, me personally, is getting to know the Lord and, and getting into the Word and reading. I, I did my best to run from stuff. You know, run from certain opportunities that were going to take me down a road. You know. Run from, you know, sometimes living on the street for a while, then you go out with the, the guys to have a couple of beers, you know, and sit and relax. And the next thing you know, there's this chip, that chip over here and everything. And say, I gotta, I'm getting out of here. I'm, I'm running from that stuff. Because, you know, different than anybody else, man, the freaking enemy, he'll really get in there in a heartbeat. Yes. Yeah. They just start reeling your, your butt in, man. 
Yep. And it becomes easy and easier to be involved. Listen, I'm not trying to preach it. I'm some kind of, it, it, this, you know, it, this is the podcast you, where, where we preach. So uh, it, it, we, it, you know, we do my best to tell people, hey, you got to run. That's, and that's what I've told my, my sons and daughters. I said, you know, when you find your mate, when you find that man or woman that's, that's uh, uh, equally yoked like you, it ain't over because because life starts throwing you stuff and then the enemy will throw you stuff you become a mark you know you're young you're good looking she's pretty and everything else like that and you know you get older and, and the, the muscles that you once had are not there anymore the stuff that used to stand up high starts shagging a little bit i said that's just life you just gotta you know the bible is replete with t- talking about you know remember the wife of your youth you know drink water from your own cistern and stuff and and people go, it doesn't say anything. Like, yes, it does. Man, st- just run from that other stuff, man. Run from that other stuff. So I've tried to do that. And I've tried to, more importantly, to witness to my my children about the important, not only to who Jesus, and they are, are all, they're all saved, but they're all freaking knuckle dragon warriors, all of them still. But they're, but the, to have a, a marriage that's lasting. And and I think that's, that's the most incredible. I, I really have a difficult time when I, when I see, you know, people talk about here, are the five things here, let me tell you how to perfect that. It's, it's a battle, man. Yeah. You're not, especially with kids, man. You're, you're in a battle every day. You're in a battle for their, for their mind. You're in a battle for their soul. You're in a, you're, you know, you, you just, that's how you think of it. That's how I think of it. You know, cause of my, my, my wife, my wife would say she doesn't think of it that way. She just, her pursuit was, you know, pursue excellence in her family and, and pursue God's love and pursue Jesus in whatever she had to do. But it, but there is no easy fix, man. And some, sometimes, you know, the only thing we do is fall on your knees. I mean, that's, and, and we're not immune from death, you know, we're not sickness, anything else like that, you know? So anyway, sorry okay. to ramble, brother. Oh, no, no, that's, that's not a ramble. That's actually, I'm, I'm thinking, I think you were sharing all that because I, I think that that explains like a lot, like uh, uh, some of the maybe the success that you had, like people or oh, like, like maybe they see only like the outer, right? They see you yeah. getting promoted, you know, as you go up up the ladder in a sense. But at home, you, it seems like the the strength, like the stability was at home that that allowed you to, to grow, you know? So, yeah, we try. You, we try as much as like you can as, you know, spit. yeah, we, we tried you each other because of the job. Sometimes it was hard. Do, but but let me give I give you a perfect example of why about my wife. Um, I uh, um, so I was working in D.C. at the time. I I was off the street. I was in Washington D.C. And the administrator at the time, uh, his name is Asa Hutchinson. He would wind up being a governor of uh, Arkansas. He was one of the guys that ran for for president. Didn't didn't make it and stuff. But but I I got along well with him he, and. Uh, and Asa just took a liking to me. It's one of those things where I, I didn't know at the time, but he just kind of took a liking to me. The following week comes. It's an absolutely true story. I get called in. Now, I am I am I, I am an assistant to one of the big shots up there. And and the 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 administrator, Hutchinson's assistant comes in and said, the administrator wants to see you. And I'm like, wait, what do you mean he wants to see me? What do you mean he wants to see me? So I go up and talk to him and he he promotes me like this super kind of promotion and stuff that we that we've never heard of in DEA before. We've never we just you don't see that. So you, t- you talk about when I look back and, and I'm I'm very thankful and I pray and I ask the Lord, thank you for giving. So one of one of the things I do all the time is I have this tendency, you know, we talk about praying always, praying always. I got into a habit of of praying about God's attributes. And I go, Lord, thank you for being a righteous guy, a holy God. And then I start thanking him for everything I have. And I invariably always thank him. Thank you for giving me the wife that I have so that I could, I could walk this path as, as well as you have allowed me. And so that, that's the kind of, you know, that's the kind of impact. That's why I, I can't stand to be around people who talk negatively about their, their wives or their husbands. I can't be, I can't, when I start to hear that, I'm like, I'm, I'm out of here. I don't have time for that. I don't, don't. Cause I, if, if that's how you're going to do with people, that's how you're probably doing it at home. I don't, I don't, I just don't have time for that. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the, the, so the, the, the few people that I do or close friends of me do, that's the thing. They put their wives up on a pedestal and, and that's where most of them, you know, belong. Again, I, listen, man, I know that there's, you know, that I know that there's sometimes problems. I know that sometimes people get married and they shouldn't get married. I, I get all that. But for me and, and my family, this is, you know, 
this is how how we've always done it and i'm thankful that the lord's allowed me to do that and it hasn't been bro it, it's it's not like it's always oh, and it's so great oh isn't it wonderful dude there were, i'm sure there were times she'd like to grab my gun and shoot me trust me she i'm sure growing up you know there's been a few times we should contemplate a homicide yeah, so yeah. uh <laughs> there was a, there was a you know that, that said uh uh, well, every time they celebrate their anniversary, that they look at one another and they say, uh, "You know, last year I could have killed you, but but we're still here." You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you, but, you know, what, you know uh, so it's. Yeah, I was gonna say you. You go know, ahead, what, I, I, I want to shift a little. So so the home, you know, it's like go, go. They, they, you know, like they see your wife and get the promotion. Could you could you talk about the career? Some of the things that you experience out there. Like some of the, you know, like uh, I guess some of the case. I mean, not, not in detail the cases, but just things. Yeah, that so we, know, out there. Yeah, so I, I was never, a, you know, I was never a, a police officer before. I, when I came on the job, I was a lot of military and stuff. When I, when I came on, so I, I tell people all the time, I, I was, I was extremely green about you know the whole world of policing and everything else. And being an agent doesn't mean you're a cop. It's just a different type of investigation. But one of the things. Uh, I just shared this with somebody. So one of the things was when, when I first came on the job, it was in the tail end of the cocaine cowboy days. It was the tail end of the Miami cocaine cowboy days. It had already started shifting all the dope coming in from uh, Colombia, Bolivia, and Peru was already shifting into Mexico, coming up through the Southwest border, being staged in LA and out. We were just trying to understand what was happening because Miami was it, man. Miami, New York was it, man. New York for heroin, Philly for heroin, Miami for cocaine. That's just the way it was. And so, so our agency had a tendency to have this kind of, you know, tunnel vision on say, well, that's what's happening. Well, the, the, you know, the bad guys have already reshifted and everything. And so I used to say, I used to say early on, I go, Lord, I, and this is how I pray. I said, Lord, I don't know if this is a good prayer. I don't know if I'm supposed to pray like this, but can you help me get the bad guys? Can you? Can you help me get, you know, the dope and the money and all people say, I'm, you're never going to see this again. You're never going to see that again. That was my, that was my dopey prayer. Hey, I was doing you know what the funny thing is about that. You're praying, help you catch the bad guys and the bad guys are praying. Lord, don't let them, don't let them catch <laughs> oh no. Them. Yeah, no, no, no. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. I sent them one time, everything else. Like, oh, bless them. They got, oh yeah. They guys would go to witch doctors and bless their yeah. dope and everything else. And I, and yeah, no, no, I was well aware of it. But I go, no, my God's bigger, man. He's, I got a bigger God than you do. So no kidding. You know, no, we, we go into a, come, never forget. We, we, we hit a place and, uh, and they had the, uh, they had, I forget which, which saint they had up there. It was the sacred, this, that, the other thing. This is a big statue. I grabbed the statue because I'm thinking it's under there. And I was working with the Cuban cop and he went, oh my God, you can't do that. You're going to be cursed. I go, I'm not going to be cursed. No, you don't understand that they do this. I said, no, you don't. I swear. I said, you don't understand my God. You, you have, you know, my God is the God. He's like the man. He's the guy. So I'm joking. I'm getting off a little bit, but I, oh, but good. I prayed those. I prayed that, you know, pray those kind of prayers. And again, brother, I don't mean to come across like, Oh yes, there was Jim Capra. This dope. No, man, I was, I was tough and grinding on the street with a bunch of other tough, tough guys. These are guys that you'd want with you in a fight guys. You want you on the front door guys. that You want with you in a firefight. These were, focused, driven uh, uh, men and women. And so those are the kinds of guys that I went, they're all different now. They're all not, not everybody, most man, not everybody was a believer or anything else like that. So I, that's the kind of prayer I prayed. And consequently, we wound up doing some of the biggest cases that have ever been seen. One, one, you know, really some just amazing, huge cases that kind of broke the lid off some of the Mexican cartels and stuff. But so those are the kinds of things that, that we did. But we still, I don't want anybody to think that it was Mamby Pamby Christian stuff. It was, you, if, if you're a bad guy and I'm coming after you, you're screwed. Yeah. You just, that's how I would tell. And this is not being macho. You'd be the strongest guy in the world. But, but if you're a bad guy and I'm coming after you, you're, you're done. You're not going to be able to hide. It's just one of those things. And that's the kind of people that I work with every day. I'm, we didn't, we're not going to give it up. You know, we're not, that's not the kind of thing kind of driven in, in that way. So you're driven in that way. And you believe in that we're, you know, that, that I belong to the God of the universe. Guess what? You know, you're now you're really screwed, you know, excuse me, but that's, that's the truth, man. That's just, Hey, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but 
uh, God's, God's always, when I look, he's always honored me. He's always blessed me. It's not like I didn't have tough times. It's not like we didn't have illnesses, not like in my family I didn't have to experience death. We had all that stuff, but, but one of the, one of the, I give you an example. And I, and I say this cause I'm, I'm on, I'm not embarrassed about it. When I first got that big promotion from the administrator I talked about, I never forgot sitting in the chair and, and, and I closed my door, came out to the front, kneeled down in front of my desk and said, Lord, I don't, I don't know why you have me here. And I started getting emotional a little bit. This is, this is not the way to think. It's like telling God, this is not the way it's supposed to work. You know, I think they might've made a horrible mistake. That's why I'm here. And I joke about that, but I was serious because part of me was excited about the position, but the other half of me was kind of scared and nervous. And then when I wound up taking over Dallas um, years ago, I, I remember because um, early on in, in my career, one of the um, we weren't out there. We we're on another deal, but probably one of the worst shootings that we've ever had. We lost two two agents, and one was was it was terrible. It was just it was it was horrible. And uh, you kind of never forget the screams, and you never forget stuff. But I remember when I got to Dallas. One of the first things I did is I got out of my car, I got there early, I just kind of walked around the property, walked around the property praying. So Lord, you you have me here for a reason. Um, please protect these men. I, I don't know. I was just talking to. I was just talking to. So you you put me here. I don't know why yet, but I'm here, and I, I just I I, I want to not just honor you, but I want to be a good representative, whatever that means. Still being a chucklehead, Lord. And then walked around, touched the gates, walked around the whole property, man. Walked all around the property and touched the fence. And said, Lord, bless this place, protect these men. And for the six years that I was there. Uh, it, they had, it was a stellar six years. I mean, thank goodness, you know, my, most, all of my the men and women were, you know, we, we still lost people, but they were lost to like death or an accident. You know what I mean? We didn't lose anybody in an operation or stuff like that. So I, I just, I believe that, that God honored that prayer. I just, I just believe it. He honored, honored that prayer. And it, again, I tell people all the time, brother, because I'm a because I'm a Christian, because I believe in Jesus Christ that He's my Savior. What He did on the cross, uh, He took my sins, and as far as the East is from the West, He threw them away. That's hard sometimes to reconcile with. That's hard to, but He did. And so I'm I'm going with that. This the older I've gotten, this life is temporary. And so one of the things that I talk about now when I go out is how much time do you have? People, we talk. How, how much time do you have? How much time do you have left? You start to put that into reality. It's just, there is, and I think everybody intrinsically knows, I love these people. Well, there's nothing after this. Really? You don't think so? What you're doing is you're hiding that. You don't, you don't want it. But we, I think we all, he's built it into us to know there's something else. Man. There's something beyond us. And Jesus talked about it all the time. Only two places are going to go. You're either going to go and stand before the Lord when he says, come on in, man. And I'm being, you know, being a little glib about that. Or you, you go to a place that's, that's was designed for you know the fallen angels yeah. so this serious when you start thinking about it man people laugh and they go oh that's fairy tale stuff you know? if i'm wrong i got nothing to lose right yeah. if if we're wrong about our faith omar if we're wrong about heaven if we're wrong that when we die uh we we don't go somewhere we have nothing to lose but if we're right which we are but the bible tells us what jesus talked about you know, people forget Jesus talked about hell. He talked about heaven. He talked about, you know, and I, I go back to think, think about, I think one of the best stories, you know, within our community, when I now I'm talking about the Christian community, there's all sorts of us, right? You, me, people from bizarre backgrounds, people who are extremely wealthy, people who are, you know, nearly destitute, all in that kind of part of that, you know, the Christian community. Uh, um, I mean, there's you hear different ways of people. This is what you have to do. You got to do this. You got to belong to this. You better be baptized. You know, the, the guy on the cross, the two thieves on the cross, man, I remind people. And I, I use this in one of my books at the end because I talked a lot about my faith. I wrote a book called Raising Courageous Children in a Cowardly Culture. And I just thought it wasn't a how to book, man. It was just my son came home. He was um, he was a cop. He's a SWAT guy. And and. He said, Dad, what's wrong? This is what he said. What's wrong with my generation? I'm like, well, that, op that opens up things wide open. And what he was getting at, he was, he was frustrated with some of the ethical things. He was frustrated with some of the other issues he's faced with. He was frustrated with that men and women his age 
looked at work a little bit differently. And so I went to my wife and I said, well, what would you think if we just wrote our story? Not a how to. We just talked. And it's really a book about hope. It's about what it what we did to raise six kids a purpose. And we didn't leave anything out. And we just done good, the bad, and the ugly. But throughout it, I talked about our faith. Throughout it, I talked about how important our faith was. Throughout it, I talked about how much it was important to us <laughs> to pour into that. And at the end of the book, I said, listen, some of you who've read this, you know, have heard a lot about, you know, you're going, what is this, what is this Jesus thing? So what is this Christian thing? I said, let me, let me offer this up. I said, when Jesus was crucified on the cross, he had two thieves that were crucified on either side of him. He says, and theologians and scholars say that they really weren't thieves, that they were probably murderers. And that's why they were being, they were, that's why they were, they were being crucified. And the one guy actually started, the one guy started cursing. He said, well, if you're this guy, get us off. If you're this guy, get us off. But the other, the other guy, uh, the other thief on the cross looked over because he knew. I think he, I think he knew. He said, hey, Lord, when you go in, when you go into, you know, your kingdom, remember me, remember me. What did Jesus say? He said, today, not tomorrow, not, not this. He didn't ask him if he was a Baptist, a Catholic, a Lutheran. He didn't ask him if he got baptized. He didn't believe, he didn't ask him, do you believe in post-trib, mid-trib? He didn't ask him if he was a Calvinist. He didn't ask him if it's Armenian. He said, today, you'll be with me in paradise. He didn't ask him how much he tithed, right? He just said, today, because he knew the man's heart. Yeah. Today, you'll be with me. And I tell people all the time, man, some, we get so caught up with, well, what do I got to do? What do I got? You just got to go before him and say, hey, Lord, it's me. Forgive me. For, for, you know, forgive me. And he promises. He said, whosoever believes in me, that yet, yet though he or she dies, will live. Yeah. I'm, I'm up with that. I'm, I'm that guy. I'm, I, I, I'm the guy. You know the story about, the, about when Jesus tells the story about the two guys in the wall? And, and they're, the one guy is, is sitting there going, oh, Lord, I'm glad I'm not a sinner like that guy, right? I, I, I was okay. just thinking about that one. Right? He's, oh, boy, look how, look how. And the other guy, he won't even get close to the wall. He's got his head bowed. Oh, Lord, forgive me. You know, he's forget. I, 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 I get that guy. Yeah. It's, it's like, it's me again, Lord. It's, it's me again. I'm still dealing with this. I still struggle with this. I still got this, you know. And in my mind's eye, I go, Lord's going, hey, it's it's. It's Jimmy again. He doesn't get it. It's all right, man. It's all right. No, get back in the arena. The, the part about that story I love, it says that he couldn't even lift up his eyes, that he had his yeah. head down while the other guy was like, there, there I, yeah, there. How, how great he was. And uh, yeah, yeah. I, I think that, that that's what we need to be with. Like, also, like, yeah, yeah. They, they didn't one of the thieves also say, like, man, why are you talking to him? Like, like we deserve to be here. That's what I mean. That's the guy. This man has he, done nothing, you know? Yeah. And, he, and, we and, deserve this. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's it. When we come into this, we realize what I deserve is wrath. Yeah. What I deserve, you know, is 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 death, torment, and all the other. Things. But but he said his grace is sufficient, dude. I, I, like I said, man. Hey, if if I'm wrong, Omar, if you're wrong, so what? What if we're wrong? So we go into the death, but we know we're not. You know, the Lord the Lord said He's put it into all men's heart to seek Him. Yeah. Right, you know, so a sinner saved by grace. A, a lot of times, uh, people think that we we do like let's say the the good quote unquote good things. Yeah, we're in favor with God, but it's it's when we like you mentioned that that guy that he said, "Man, uh, Lord, forgive me for I'm a sinner." Yeah, I have sinned against you is is like knowing that like you mentioned like we deserve God's wrath, but He's given yeah. us His mercy, His grace, His forgiveness. Yeah. That's what makes us do those good works that I think yeah. is too that he said that he that he prepared beforehand for us yeah. to, to walk in. How, so, how cool is that, man? He knew you before the beginning of the earth, the foundation. The Bible says that before the foundations of the earth, he knew you and he knew you by name. That like you start trying to wrap your head around that, it's like, dude, I don't know, you know. What? He he so that, and that's there's a the other thing I've been because the older you get, I go, there's a there's a couple of places in, in Psalms and in Proverbs of Lord, teach me to number my days so that I may gain a heart of wisdom. Yeah. And so when you break that down, you say, teach me to number, no, toward, Lord, teach me to understand. I'm only here for a moment. And even Jesus, for, for right, for a vapor. And in that time, teach, t make me understand that so that when I do this life, I do it with wisdom in terms of what, you know, what am I doing for you? What am I doing? And I, and I think part of that for me was what am I doing 
it's really important for me to pour into my, you know, my family. People, as I'm raising my kids, some people would say, hey, maybe you should do this with church. And we just I said, listen, dude, my, my responsibility, not just in my profession, is to raise up these, these children I have and my wife, first of all, to pr- protect them, to make sure that I'm making money so that we can pay mortgages, but more importantly, so that they all know who Jesus is. Mm-hmm. And after that, after that, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm good to go. So I, I was, th- that was important to me because I, I got asked, well, did you get involved in church? Did you get involved in this? Dude, I, you, I'm my day just working sometimes, especially on the street, go from 12 to 16 hours a day or more living out there. And then when I had time for my family, when I made time, I made time, you know, that was important. I made time for the family. So, so one of the things I talk about, Omar, was, is I tried to my best is to be intentional, intentional in my faith, intentional as a husband and intentional as a dad. Being intent- I mean, do things on purpose with, you know, with them. And so, um, and, and I hope, you know, for my, my children and my wife, and the feedback that at least they're giving me, I, I, I was okay. You know, wasn't perfect, but I, <laughs> my, hey, my wife's still with me after 42 years. Man. So she, she, she can't complain. <laughs> you know what, speaking of uh, intentionality, like uh, I'm involved in ministry. You know, I go to church, involved in Ben's ministry, uh, me and my wife, elders at church, and we're yeah. involved in ministry. And, and then I do the podcast one day, then I edit on another day. So it takes up a lot of time. So from uh, yeah. June 7th to July 7th, I took a, a 30-day break. And Good. I, I told my kids, like, whatever you guys need me to do with you guys, for you guys, put it on the calendar. So I took off yeah. 30 days and Good. I, I took them driving because uh, um, they're uh, one's 19, one's 17. So I'm teaching them how to drive. And yeah. so I, 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 what, the reason I did that, because I felt I, I don't want them to ever resent ministry yeah. or to say, God, uh, I mean, dad put ministry before us because they yeah. are my first ministry. My yeah. wife my kids so bible and bible talks about that yes. man. bible talks about being able to take care of your family versus other things becomes one of the most you know important things you know it's it's kind of like work-life balance even though that, that's all it's, it's sometimes difficult to really put your your finger on but if you don't make time if you're not intentional with your family and with your children if you don't i, I would tell people stop and i got to come up for air i have to you can get lost you can get burned out you get burned out with church stuff. You can get burned out with, with small group meetings and stuff like that. People, oh, no, you can't. Yes, you can. Yeah. You can. <laughs> Just be mindful of that. Yeah, definitely. That's good that you are, man. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. You know what? I want to ask you about uh, leadership. I know I know you're very big into leadership. And, I, and I, like I told you, I was listening to one of the, the podcasts you did. And, and there's there's a lot of leaders out there that believe that you shouldn't build, like, relationship with those under yeah. you. you Yeah. <laughs> Rule, you know, tell them what to do. Yeah. Like said, but uh, I, I, um, from from what I heard you say, you you have a very different perspective. You you want to share on your view uh, as far yeah. as yeah. So it's funny because it's still there's so much stuff out there. If you Google leadership, you'll hit 50 million hits. You'll get people that are as young as 23 running around trying to tell people how to run an organization to to other people. So I have the secret sauce to doing it. Um, I I just use what. The way I, I walked into leadership was, and I learned a lot, made a lot of mistakes, you know, made a, made a ton of mistakes. And I was fortunate to have men and women who, who loved me and, and, and forgave me for, you know, my shortfalls. But I tell people, if you, if you decide to go into a leadership position, what you're doing is you're, you're deciding to walk into a place where you're going to learn how to love people. And people go, what are you talking about? So you, you, and, and they get this concept of love screwed up, man. Like it's a, a quiver in your liver. This, I said, love it. You, in other words, you have to consciously love your people and care about these men and women. You have to, you, you have to want to care about them. It's, it's not, you, you don't hold them accountable. They're not going to hold you accountable. It's not, you know, everybody gets a hug. It's you care about them as human beings. And here's the weird thing, especially for us. Here's one of the challenges for us. Man, it's, it's easy to like people who are like us. Oh, he's got the same faith. He has the same political. Maybe he looks the same. That's easy to do. It's different, man, when you're working alongside of men and women who think differently good than you. They believe differently in terms of maybe their faith, uh, uh, maybe their familial situation. It, it's different. They, they feel completely opposite than you. But when you're their leader, you still got to care about them. You, you don't have to agree with somebody's lifestyle. You don't have to agree with somebody's faith. It's not what you're called to. You're, you're called to love them and care about them. 
and say, okay, and then you want to develop them professionally and personally. And you do that by, and how you do that is by, you start to have a relationship with them. You get to know people. And that's a hard thing to do because some people don't, don't want you to know them. It's a hard, it's a walk. It's, you're always, you know, you're always learning. Like, it's not about I'm the boss, you do what I say. That's, that's old news, man. It's about, hey, man, how, how, you know, how are you doing? What's happening? You know, and I, I have, you know, one of the things when I wrote my first book I wrote is Leadership at the Frontline. And I, I just talked about my walk. I just talked about the things that I learned. And, I, and people said, what's the, what's the best way to leave? I said, you learn to love people, love to care about them. I don't, I don't care what organization you're doing. And these researchers, there's a bunch of research guys that are out there that have written all sorts of great books. And, and every one of these men and women who've written books on, on leadership and research it always comes down to the best CEOs, the best leaders are men and women who cared about their people. Hey, listen, man, you're, if, if you're running a business and you're in it for a profit, we get that. But the only way to get there, the only way to get to the profit, to get to those cores is your men and women who take you there. And the only way they'll take you there if they know that they're cared about, that they're genuinely cared about. Your number, your number one thing that you're missing is your men and women. Do you care about them? I mean, do you, do you, really, do you really care about them? And so I have stories in the book about, you know, things that you learn, you watch people go through. You know, what, where in any leadership book does it talk about when you're sitting in your office and somebody comes in and sits down and says, my wife just left me sits down and says, my kid was killed in an accident. You get a phone call at 2 a.m., you know, sits down. And, and this, these are things that have happened in my walk. And now I said, my wife is just diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. Well, let me, let me see, where is that in the book? It isn't, man, it isn't. And there are times in my career in the walk that sometimes you can't, I can't, I can't bring the kid back. I can't take his disease away. But in that moment, I could put my arm around that person. Something I've done it. You put your arm around somebody, you cry with them. Man. Yeah. You, you can't do anything. You can't do anything else, you know, or, or, or if they're receptive to it, you take a moment just to pray for a minute or bless them, you know, be there, comfort them. That, that's it, man. That's, that's it. Somebody has a baby and they can't make it to work. They work going to be here tomorrow, man. Don't worry about it. It'll be, it'll be here tomorrow. And so when you start to walk like that and the way you walk like that, if you're going to walk your walk as a Christian, that starts to become crystal clear to you. Those things become a problem. Now, listen, there, there were people, it's almost impossible to fire people in federal government, number one. But there were some people in my walk that I did have to fire. There were people that I said, you're not getting promoted. There were some people that I had to look at and go, you, you can do better than this and you're not. And guess what? I'm moving you from here to here. You know, maybe, you know sometimes I want to say, hey, you suck. But it's, that's frowned upon, you know. But, but really, the, the, I still had to do those types of things. I still had to tell people, no, man, you're not. You're not, no, sorry. Hey, will you support me in a transfer? No, why? Because you ain't doing what you should be doing. So, th so it doesn't remove you from those things, yeah. right? And people said, well, do you care about them? Yeah, I still cared about them. You know, I, I did care about them. I'm going to tell one guy I thought he was a cancer. So you're a cancer. Well, one of the words I heard you say uh, in, in that uh, interview, uh, accountability, because a, a lot of times we think love, we, we got to get the people to like us, but... You yeah, I'd like to worry about yeah. uh, you, you, uh, a word you use a few times is moral compass and how yeah. at times you had to share your moral compass with other yeah. uh, men that were on their way. I believe you like almost like he heading straight down, down a cliff in a sense. But yeah, by the I talk about the yeah. lifestyle that they were uh, living. I, I talk about that a lot when, when, when uh, one of the things I talk about is moral and ethics and, and what, where your moral compass is and don't compromise them. And so, you know, there's kind of like lock from years ago, locker room talk and all this other stuff. And uh, you have to set the example. I had a, um, and there's been a few times in my walk where I grabbed somebody, put them off. I said, I never want to hear you say that in here. Don't ever, I never want you to, it, what you're, somebody was bragging about, you know, an affair, or bragging about this, that, and the other thing. So don't even do that. That's cancer. Don't do it. I mean, if that's, if you want to, if you want to ruin your life, you know, there's been a few times. They're about to say that you know, if you want to ruin your life, that's up to you, but you don't bring that in here. I'm not, put, I'm not putting up with that stuff. You know, you're not, you know, you're, that that's just not going to happen. I had, I, I was overseas training and I literally had somebody that I thought I knew that I did. Some guy kept saying, Hey, Hey, they were sitting around with a bunch of flight attendants or something. And anyway, guy kept going, Hey, come to the table, come to the table, come to the table, come to the table, sit with us. And man, dude, I'm, that's stuff that I run from. Sorry. Sorry. And this one guy came up to me. This is, one guy came up to me, pointed his little bony fingers out. If you were, this is what he had. The, he had the, 
he had the friggin' cojones to tell me. He said, you know, if, if I, you hung out with me, if I hung out with you for a week, this is what he said. He said, I'd corrupt you in a heartbeat. That's what he told me. That's what he said to me. I, I wanted to punch him in the face. I've known him for a long time. But honestly, I want to punch him right in the face. I thought I knew him. Family knows him. Didn't know him at all. It was, I was killing me. I, said, I can't believe he's saying this. And I remember looking at him and saying, let me tell you something, man. I can come become like you like that. So just what he did like that. I said, you can never be me again. You can't. And I walked away. Now that was pretty freaking mean, dude. But he was so convinced that because that's the kind of life he, I didn't know he lived that kind of life. This is, listen, bro, this is somebody that we would have at the house and family. And I know I, I didn't know who this person was. And I, I just said, mm, uh, no, and you're not going to, you're not going to get away with that. Omar, I, I first, I would tell people this. What do you believe? I go, what do you mean? About, about everything. Well, about my faith. Sure. About your faith. But what do you believe about your work? What do you believe about being a father? What do you believe about you know, being a son, what do you believe about your employment? What do you believe? Because your those beliefs, your hardwired beliefs, that's why the, our faith is so important. Those beliefs are so those those things wind up that you can't see them. So if I had a triangle, your your beliefs are kind of underwater, thinking about the iceberg, right? But but those beliefs start to establish the things that you value, yeah. right? That you value. That's why let's let's go back to the street, right? When you when we're on the street, when you're on, you run into we, you know you run into gangsters and everything, and you start talking. Believe, some of these guys don't believe in anything. They, have, they don't believe in terms of they, they or they have a twisted sense of morality. They have a twisted sense of right and wrong. They have a twisted sense of of the family. That's why we can look at people and say he has a bad character. But character is nothing more than the execution of what you believe. Again, character is nothing more. That you're shown what you believe. This is this is what I believe, you know. Because your those beliefs kind of start to that they'll start wrangling and start establishing not only your values and then your values will lead to your actions. I can watch your actions. So let's say I don't know you from anything. I don't know what you believe, but if I took the time, if I could, and followed you around for maybe two or three days, I I could understand what you believe. Right. It wouldn't take me much. It wouldn't take much time. Same thing. Same thing with me. Follow me around. See. What believe? And every now and then I go, man, I didn't know you were that much of a chucklehead, you know. So, so in a sense, you're constant, and it's you never get there, man. You never, you never arrive at being this kind of, you know, grandiose. You're always, you know, you're always, le- you know, learning. And there are times you got to go back, and man, you got, you, you know, wind up telling people, hey, you're sorry, you know, you're sorry about stuff that happens. It shouldn't, shouldn't be all the time, but every now and then we got to go, hey, man. I used to tell people, the older I got, I used to tell people that how much, I, you know, you love them. That's also some, some, some good stuff, man, especially like uh, leadership and the family. And, and I think it's very important. Like, I, I know you, you you mentioned a lot about the home, but I, I believe it starts there. Like I, I, I tell people, like, what's the point of me succeeding, let's say, in ministry, at work, and my, my family's like, like like falling apart, you know? Yeah. So I, I believe it, it starts at home, with, with, uh, first and foremost, with the wife. A lot yeah. of times people think, oh, it's with my kids. No, it's not. It's with yeah. the wife. Uh, I, I read a book and it said, uh, best, uh, the best thing you could do for your kids is to love their mother. Yeah. That's, that's something that, that I strive to do, like to try to keep yeah. the peace at home. And another thing, uh, speaking of peace at home, uh, uh, another thing that he said was like, uh, the world's going to beat you, beat you up. Uh, the workplace is going to beat you up. If the home ain't a safe place for you to run to, where are you going to run to? You know, if our kids. That's. Hundred percent, because there's chaos, because there's conflict, yeah. because there's always fighting and arguing. Why yeah. would they want to come home? You know, like yeah, the home should be like the the, the refuge. You know, like that's exactly right. And that's one of the things Michelle and I used to talk about. Home it should be a refuge. In other words, but uh, and I talked about some you know, watching some of my kids uh, going through stuff as they got. You know, people go, "Oh, your kids must all be they didn't do drugs because you were." Listen, I I will have. A lot of friends and acquaintances who in the same career I did, who, you know, taking their kids to rehab, some lost, you know, it's just, it's, it's ugly, but the home should be a refuge. And what I mean by that is if my kids found out they were, they were in quicksand in life, that home was a place that they can come back to and touch base. And I said, my, my daughter said this to me, she was sitting out, I took her out. So went out to breakfast, little hole up the road here. And while we're eating, she goes, Dad, she goes, she goes, can I, I'll tell you something. I said, why? She goes, you and mom are a fairy tale. I was like, what? She was Dad, you and mom are a fairy tale. You're a freaking fairy tale. And I'm like, where the heck is this coming from? You know, I'm, I'm trying to, okay, you know. She said, 
I, I don't have a single friend. I don't have a single single friend. She, this is what she told me. And she spent a lot of time in the Northeast and it's really liberal. I don't have a sim- single friend whose mom or dad haven't been married, divorced a few times. None of them. She said, I don't, I don't have, most of the people that I know, I know they have, you know, this, that, and the other thing. She says, you got your guys' fairy tale. I said, let me tell you something. I said, you never saw the, mom and I kept the dark side of the fairy tale away from you. We did our best we could. Okay. I said, we, we, we really did. I said, you, you think for one minute there weren't times, you know, especially in younger years, that your, your, your mom more than likely than me looked and said, what the hell am I doing with this thing? You know, I, could, I could be a seat. I could, she was. She was climbing up the ladder in, in IBM. And I said, you, you didn't see the times that we're worried. Can I make the mortgage payment? There you see the times that we didn't make this payment the late on so we can make that payment on this on. You didn't see the number of times we went when we're out in LA that thank God for these little friggin' uh, markets where you can buy clothes for your kids and stuff. We weren't poor, dude. Don't get me wrong, we weren't poor. But I said, you just didn't see that time. Yeah. I said, we kept grinding, we kept saying, okay, Lord. We kept, you know, kept at it every day. I said, for us, we just said we promised each other we're not giving up. And again, I, I told her this, like I told her, I said, I'm sure mom probably could have wanted to commit homicide a few times, but we never, you know, we never, we're never going to give up. I said, we just tried to hide that from you guys a lot. You know, oh, you saw us argue and from time to time, but you, you we didn't, we, we tried not to have that. And we did our best to, you know, to pour into you what, 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 you know, maybe what the Lord wants for your life. And what he wants is he wants your heart first. So yeah, I got involved in, in men's ministry for a while and, I said, man, you know, we, we're not good at sharing our, our problems with other men because that's weakness, right? Yeah. We're not, we're just not good. I have a, I have a friend of mine, I call him accountability brother. He was never caught with marketing. I love him dear men through the men's thing, but he's a guy that I can sit with and I could drop my guard around. What I mean by that is I can say completely different walk of life, man. And, but I, we can sit out for, uh, sit down and, and, and I, I can say to him, Hey, how's it going? I go, man, it sucks. I'm having this, that, and the other. And there's been a few, a few times in the course of our, our good friendship in the last seven or eight years that uh, that we've done that, you know. And and here's what you get from that. That's why I think when you talk about accountability, I call yeah. him an accountability brother. This is why those things become important, I think, especially for men, is you need somebody that you can talk to. And I tell men all the time, don't have an accountability sister. And that, ain't, that don't work. Don't, don't go there. Get somebody like you who's, you know, same faith, same moral compass, the best you know. Maybe you know them through the men's ministry and, and stuff. And just be you, yeah. you know, just be you. So when I retired, I did things a lot differently. I decided to do the speaking thing. And a few years down the road, it's going good. COVID hit, shut everything down. And I was I was really at an all-time, things really weren't happening for the, for the speaking and everything. I was coming home and there was a particular station I listened to. Um, called the word fm and it has a couple of pastors that i really like that are teachers and a uh commercial came on this the, the station manager says hey have you ever basically talking about having your own radio station i'm like hey man i have a radio station i was just pulling into my complex and everything so i pull in i don't i don't omar i don't do anything big or you know little without talking to my wife that's just how i've been and and that's not because oh jim did that that's because my father taught me about that he used to say all the time, I tell mom, and she said, I tell your mother everything. I told your mother everything that happened at work. I tell your mother when he was a cop, I tell your mother everything. So that, that I, I, any, anytime I'm trying to think about, am I going to do this? When I started writing, when I started, when I decided to do this business, I ran by her. Because if she said, that doesn't sound good, I would go, er, okay, hang on. Because you know, sometimes for men, Faye taught me this. Bill Faye taught me this. Sometimes for men, he would say, because, you know, sometimes God speaks to men through their wives. Yes. Definitely. You just learn to listen, learn to listen, he'd say. I never forgot that. I mean, I, ne- I never forgot that. So anyway, I hear this and I don't say anything to Shell. So I come home, I go to my desk, I get on the email and I email this guy, uh, you know, an email said, hey, this is who I am. Mom of other side, the other day. That's it. 20 minutes later, I get a phone call. I almost hung up on it because I thought it was spam or something. I pick it up. Hey, hey this is so-and-so from, I, and I, I almost said, who the blank is this? You know, huh? He goes, oh, you sent an email. And I'm like, oh, oh. <laughs> and now I'm talking to a Christian station. Oh, oh. I, I said, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. 
<laughs> so, so that's true, man. So I start talking to a guy and he said, Hey, listen, we, we, we'd really like you to come down. I want to talk to you. So we looked at it. He goes, we don't have anybody like you. I was like, Oh, well, listen, I can't do anything. I got to, I, I don't even run this by my wife. So I come into the office real quick. I said, Hey, let me run something by you. I mean, I can get five, six, seven words out of my house. You got to do it. You got to do it. So we go down and meet with them and, and we, we do a one year contract with them and we're on we're on first on the air once a week and then it was twice a week and then it was a half hour program called leadership at the front line and i would upload it to um spotify and they're all still on there under leadership at the front line and it was so much fun and uh it was a lot of i was talked about trying to talk about leadership through the lens of faith for the most part and i had a lot of different guys on there from different walks of life and stuff and a um, couple of really uh, power players on there. The former director of national intelligence, John Ratcliffe, who's a friend of mine, used to be a U.S. attorney. And, and uh, not, not everybody was a evangelical, you know, so just people in positions and talking to them about leadership. But it was really it was it was joyful to do. It was. Uh, and so we uploaded the whole year, uh, different episodes onto Spotify. And uh, and then towards when the year anniversary came up, we were pumping a lot of money into it, but we weren't getting anything on return. And so from a business standpoint, you know, I did everything we could, but we just, we couldn't justify keeping putting money into it. We just couldn't. I mean, we, I mean, I, we prayed about it and everything and, and, and it's not a failure. It's just, it was that, I and mean, God allowed me to do that for a season. Right. So, so we've been praying about more gigs and trying to get out and do more speaking. And just within the last week, again, again, I, I don't believe for one minute that God's some genie that I pray and I want this and he gives it to me. That's, that's not what I'm saying. Uh, I, I believe that the seasons I'm, he's moved in the seasons that we've been in. And sometimes he's been quiet. If, if I was, if I'm honest, sometimes during my life, he was quiet, in the season, but he never left me, never abandoned me, never, never did not bless me with my, with children, with things, with, with positions, with all the other stuff, but he's not a genie. Now, I tell people all the time. That's why I said, we, we prayed earnestly about that, Radio gig, we got it. We did it for a year. Didn't work out the way we wanted it. Is it a failure? No. He gave me that opportunity for a year. I got connected to some people that had been connected to that. It's it's still on Spotify. So yeah, yeah. You can go in there and and, and listen and re- God, that's great. And so, or lately, you know, we kind of been praying because you know what opens more doors and stuff. I mean, I'm a, I'm a retired public servant, you know, all this other stuff. So I get, we're fortunate. I have a, a retirement stuff, but you know what? I, I always go, Lord, you, I want to, I want to do this more. I want to do more. I still, you've got me living here. So, and so just recently, you know, we've gotten a couple of phone calls and the gigs are going to seem to be picking up a little bit, but even if, even if they don't, here's what I'm getting to say. Even if, even if I never have another speaking gig for the rest of my life, we're good, man. God's been good to me. Yeah. You, know, I, you go. So if I if I never write again, if if I never speak again, what would you do? Nothing. I do keep thanking God, watching my family grow, ask Him to you know to bless and protect my children, speak pouring into my children, even as adults. You know, I got this tendency, not a tendency. I'm trying to get into a habit now that every night I'll send in. I love the Psalms, so I'll pull something out of Psalms and send it. My not just my kids, but their husbands and or wives, just a just a brief boom here. It, why no, not so they can walk around being holy? So it's a reminder, man. Reminder, God is good, man. Reminder, God is faithful. Reminder, God is righteous. Reminder, God is holy. Reminder, He's a just God. He loves His children. You're an heir to the King. Never forget it. We're done with this earth suit. We will stand before Him. Amen. You know that's. Yes, you no, know, that's how we try to roll, man. That's Amen. that's it. That, that's, that's, a, that's a great way to roll there, you know. You know, that's that that's it. So it doesn't I always go back to it. So I'm in some kind of club, you know, where people would say, Man, that you sound like those are losers. I, I'll be with the losers then. I'm good with that. Jesus was a loser. I'm glad to be, you know, in, in his club. It's embarrassing sometimes to look out. He really there's a there's a psalm or in, I think it's in the Psalms or perhaps says, Lord. What is man that you would even that you would even take time to like really Problem. us me yeah. honestly not not being Harry humble but look 
if I was you, I'd smite me. <laughs> I, I would, I would, you know, thank God I'm not. But, but that's, a, you know, that's the kind of stuff. That's how good that, that you know, that that God is. Yes, yes. My, I watched my brother Lou. Some six boys and a girl in my family. I know. All of them are, are still married to the same wives and. My brother Lou, uh, his wife, he was Coast Guard, and uh, his his wife, he'll, he would tell you, his first wife saved him, saved him from death. He'll tell you outright, saved me. He was a fighter. He was a uh, he was just he he was crazy. My youngest brother, but his wife tamed him. And he loved the Lord. I mean, he was, loved the Lord, but he was you know you you bumped him. Look out, or or and and his wife was amazing. Had three boys, raised them all saved by grace and i watched him he's supposed to go on a trip with me and my wife and my other brother and his wife we're all excited and on the way to the airport his wife doubled up doing what's going on and six months later she was gone right some rare form of cancer that even the cancer doctor said i've seen this once in my entire career this type of cancer devout he, my brother's a devout fit like me fight like a, a warrior his wife on her knees praying for her children, her children. And, and you sit and go, I don't, I don't get it. But I watched my brother walk through that. And I got to tell you, I, I go, Lord, I don't, I think I would fail. If, if I'm honest, bro, I, I watched him go through that with such, such uh, conviction and passion. And, and, and he, he was there when she drew her last breath in a, in a hospice and everything. Never, never. I remember him reciting Job, you know, get though he slay me. I go, and, Lord, I don't, how, how, yeah. how, man? His kid's the same way, man. His kid's the same way. And I'm like, so, so, you know, here it is. And we got even closer. My, we're all pretty close and, and we got even closer, but. After two years, I would talk to him. He just said, that. he goes, the, the loneliness. He said, I said, well, come on. He would say, well, come on, like waves. Just the, 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 he goes, I never kind of realized it. And he felt guilty that, that he, you know, was kind of looking at dating and stuff like that. Well, dude, he winds up meeting this chick who is amazing. Just an amazing gal. Uh, Christian lost her husband in a kind of a similar manner. Hit it off, and here it is now, five years later since his wife died. He's new, he's married again to this wonderful woman. God has blessed him incredibly where they live, all this other stuff. And you just go, you can't. This is a God thing, man. You can't. You know, he he makes what's the sign? He makes beauty from ashes. Yeah. You know, joy from your tears and stuff like that. And I, I just go, this is incredible. We love her, man. We we love. Her. We love my friend going out to see him in a, in a few weeks. I mean, and she's a prayer warrior, this woman, you know, she's, 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 uh, but, I, but what I'm getting to is in our walk and in our faith is we think sometimes, well, we're supposed to be immune from stuff. Dude, we ain't right. Sometimes it piles on and we look up and go, Hey, Hey, how much more? And as my watch, my brother go through this, I go, all right. I don't get it. And I, I, listen, I still, when things happen, I still, when people ask, I go, I don't know why. I, I heard Franklin Graham the other day when he was talking about the assassination attempt of uh, the former president. He's beautiful, man. He says, I don't know why God saved some people and why some people died. He goes, I don't know why. I don't know why that one guy took a bullet and the other guy didn't. I, I don't have an answer for that. And, and I often say, I, I don't even know if we're going to know on the other side. Right. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if it'll matter. You know, we don't, we don't have those, you know, answers. That's why I laugh when people try to say, well, I, I know what, I don't know what, or all I know is he's still God. No matter like, like listening to my brother go, yeah, not yet though he's slaying me, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to praise him. I'm going to honor him. I'm going to worship him. He's I, you know, cause that's it, man. What's it. This is it. We're here for a moment. Just Amen. here for a moment. So, Amen, hey man, I'm sorry, man. I was I was rambling. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, no. That's good. Uh, I was thinking about uh, uh, when the in, in Matthew eight uh, when the, the uh, Jesus got in the boat, the disciples followed him, and you would think, man, they're following Jesus, everything's gonna be good. But man, that's when the storm came, you know. So sometimes, hey, the, we're we're not yeah. the storms, and sometimes following Jesus is gonna bring us into the storms. But 
I think he desires to to strengthen our faith. I think that's that's, that's what he was trying to teach the disciples and and, and that story there. Because he asked them like, well, "Where's your faith?" You know when uh, I, know. I, I was I was uh, studying that and it said that uh, the storm didn't wake up Jesus. It was the disciples' lack of faith that got his attention. Yeah. He said, uh, "Jesus addressed man first because he knows man is the hardest to deal with." Then he rebuked the winds and the waves because he he knew that that was easy. But he's yeah, like, yeah. Let, let me How cool is that, man? These hard-headed men. <laughs> That's true, man. It is true. It, you know, they, they, there's a point. They do those dudes, been, they've been with them all this time and watching them heal, you know, the sick, the lame, the blind, raising the dead, everything else like that. And they're still panicking. Oh, yeah. we're going to die. Yeah. <laughs> I said, you know what? You, you yeah. know what I use? I, I just, I know, I've said this before. I go, listen, if I was walking with Moses, and he went up to the mountain, and I was down there forty days waiting for him. To come in. I'm convinced I'd be collecting all the earrings. Uh, I'd be convinced. Right? <laughs> I'd, I'd be one of the guys helping make that cow. I said, I said we look at it and go, oh, it wouldn't be me. And I go, Lord, I, oh, please, don't ever test me. Don't. <laughs> only by the by the grace of God, going back to the story you shared about that guy that, oh, oh give me one week and you uh, and I yeah. will be able to to corrupt you. It's only yeah. by the spirit. By the grace yeah. of God that we're not like like me like yeah. uh, it's been uh, it's gonna be uh, on October 26th of this year it'll be 20 years that I haven't drank or done any drugs. Yeah. So people ask me, oh you, uh, or they tell me, oh you got a lot of uh, willpower or a strong will and like nah like I, 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 tell, got, them, yeah. I tell them trust me it ain't me because I know me I, I yeah. know I know what this flesh desires I know yeah. what this flesh is after. And it's only by yeah. the grace of God that he's been able to keep me that this this long. And I pray it continues to go even further than this, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. 100%. Amen. That's because you know where your strength comes from. That's yeah. the thing. That we're not, exactly. We, we know, like I said, I, you know, we're not to this point where you know the guy or the gal looking back at us in the mirror. Going, oh, I know that guy. He's he, he's not well. <laughs> good, no good. Yeah, you, you know, brother, for, yeah. I was going to ask you, is, is there any, uh, uh, maybe something we didn't get a chance to touch on that you want to share before we get ready to uh, sign yeah. off? No, you know what? When I, like I said, people, I, I put something out the other day. Somebody was asked, especially when I talk, I got a heart for, you know, for parenting and children. And it's just, just so much fluff out there. There's so much, you know, especially for marriages, so many, so many things uh, out there. And I would say you, one of my, I, I got asked to speak at a prayer breakfast not not long ago, and and one of the guys asking me goes, what 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 would you say about any kind of intentionality? Get back to intentionality. I said, you know, one of the things the older I've gotten, the re, when I start to realize the brevity of our of our life, is is how important it is to do things on purpose. How important it is because we we all get into a habit of doing things. I right? get up in the morning, do our gig, do this, that, and the other. I said, even including in, in prayer, which becomes a prayer can be rote. Remember, Lord said, don't don't be like the others and sit there and say these. He, I mean, he taught them how to pray. And and I've, I've done my best to tell my kids to talk to the Lord like you're talking to him, like he's sitting next to you. Not therefore, oh God, like you said, or thou art thou, whatever. It's just, but just be honest with him. And I'm, I, I'm being intentional about if you're in pain. Don't, he gets it. He already knows. Same thing with your marriage and with your children and everything. And just believe that he's, I just got to a point where I'm believing he's going to do something about it. And if it doesn't turn out the way I want it, I'm like, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm still moving. I'm still grinding. I'm still, I'm still moving forward. I don't understand it. And, and, and like I said, I, we may not never know why he's why, why didn't he respond to this prayer or not to, but I don't know. I'm not God, but, but I know he's sovereign yes, he is. and I, I'm going to be intentional when I talk to him about, so I'm going to be honest when I talk to him about it. And then there's times of going, I tell people, I said, I, I go before him and I go, Lord, it's me again. I'm a chucklehead. I'm still freaking wrestling with this, or I'm still wrestling with that. I don't know why, or, or Lord, my eyes weren't on this. They were on something else. And you know, all those things that kind of hit you and you, there's no excuse for it. There's just, you know, we're, we, by nature are rebellious. Yeah. We're we're rebellious, you know. Remember how he called Israel the stiff-necked and rebellious people. And I, I go, we're that's us, yeah. you know. That that's us, you know. I want it. And I want it now. Well, that's not how he he works. This is this is his. We're his. We're we belong to him. And then I I, I I've said before. I think when you break down the Lord's prayer, I said I I somebody I said you know one of the 
one of the one of the hardest things to pray if we if we break down Lord our Father how art there you know when we get into your will be done on earth as in heaven we zip past that when you stop for a minute man and you go we're telling the Lord your will not my will see I want things bro the way I want things I know what I want yeah. I know what I want in my life my marriage in my checkbook I know those things but when you decide to yield and go Lord. I still would like these things, but your will be done. I mean, man, think about Jesus. Think about Jesus for a minute. He's a fully God and fully man. And he goes before the father and says, if you, if, if you would, you know, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, your will. Hey, Amen. Thank you for, for, for sharing all that. And for, you know, sharing your story. And I'm sure we could have uh, dove into all type of other stories <laughs> and things that, that went on, but uh, could you uh, close us out in a prayer? Yeah, I would love to, man. I would love to father. Oh, Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to be with Omar tonight, Lord. Lord, I pray that that uh, the words of my mouth and his mouth were acceptable to you, Father God, that we gave you honor and praise. Lord, you, you're so good, Lord. I look back now when we when we talk often, Lord, when we're on these podcasts, get an opportunity to think back in my life. And, and in every moment, in every second, in every tear and every laughter that you were there. And Father, I, I ask that, that whatever ears hear this, Lord, that it'll open their ears and their heart to you, Lord Jesus. I thank you for Omar, Lord. I ask that you bless him, bless his podcast, bless his family, Father God. I ask all this in the name above all names, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen, amen, brother. Hey, you know, before we sign off, could, could you share, uh, the? Uh, I know you have a website, and could you also share the names of the books you've written? Like the, uh, yeah. And maybe you, the, the, yeah, the, the, so the uh, podcast the, name the, as well? Yeah, the the the. You can find the podcast under Spotify. Uh, it's under Leadership at the Front Line under, at Spotify. And then the the uh, the books are all found on Barnes & Noble. The first book is Leadership at the Front Line, and it's called Lessons Learned um, About Loving, Leading, and Legacy from a Warrior Public Servant. The second book, um, which, you really, which really Shelly and I wrote together, my wife and I co-wrote, it's called uh, Raising Courageous Children in a Cowardly Culture. And it's the battle for the hearts and minds of our children. It's just, it's our story. It's not a how-to book. Um, actually, that was the third book. The second book was called The Eagle and the Seagulls. And it's a story I made up for my kids about how to face storms in your, in your life. And it's, a, it's, we call it a wisdom story for, for children and adults. Again, all this is on Barnes and Noble. And uh, was it last October, it might be two years, we wrote, it's called, it was a children's series called Pop-Up's Amazing Bedtime Stories. And it's um, it's stories I made up for the kids, and you know it's the kids go spend the night at uh, grandparents' house, and they spend the night in a spare room, and there's basically a, a wagon, and when they stay there, they play with the wagon. That wagon turns into one book, turns into an airplane, and literally the kids fly the airplane to see their cousins. Another one, it turns into a submarine, uh, and then the third one, it turns into a rocket ship. And there's always a nemesis. There's always something that's trying to get them or something, but it's a very light. It's imaginative. Right. Um, uh, so yeah, we, we did the, that. That was a lot of fun, but it's been, again, who, uh, you know, who would have thunk it? A guy that barely got out of high school. <laughs> so, uh, but it's been good. And like I said, it, it uh, God's been good to us. Just Amen. been fantastic. Amen. Praise God for, for God. And like you mentioned earlier too, like your wife, you know, like encouraging, yeah. pushing you and yeah. hold, 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 yeah. holding down the fourth. The four yeah, man. Where I work and doing everything. I, I would. I wouldn't be here. Trust me. I would not be here. Amen. If hey, not for that. You know what, brother? I I believe you have a a, a, a website as well. If you, you want to. Check. I do. It's yeah. It's called um, uh, geez, I hardly. Heard, but it's frontlineleadershipgroup.com. That's frontlineleadershipgroup.com. And there's a couple of things. Some of the books are on there. Uh, there's some video video of me on there. I got interviewed and a few other things. But you look that. Uh, kind of spells out the things that I do and, and what the uh, little company, it's just a little, it's me, you know, it's really just me. So, um, but again, God's been good to us. Amen. Yes, yes, he has, man. Thank, thank you for uh, taking this time to spend with us. Uh, thank you for sharing your story, brother. And uh, man, I uh, uh, appreciate you. Uh, God bless you, your your marriage, your children, grandchildren. Thanks, brother. All, Same all, to you, all, man. All, all, all the men that you're Im impacting, all the men that you're holding accountable. And yeah. Uh, leading with love you know that's that that's amazing that's, it, man. <clears throat> that's true at, at working at home man don't don't lose your home that's so right, that's right I, I, we're gonna get ready to uh...
to, to wrap up, uh, uh, I want to thank my brother for joining us. Uh, Matthew 416 reads, the, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And upon those who sat in the region and the shadow of death, light has dawned. Alongside my brother, Jim Capra, my name is Omar Calvillo, and we are Wrong to Strong. Thank you.